What up? What up? What up? Podcast party people. I have got a hell of an interview for you. I got a hell of an interview for you guys today. Very honored to have this man on my podcast. A legendary Hall of Famer baseball manager, Tony La Russa. He has been a friend of mine and a friend of the band for some time now. He's a big supporter, and I'm a big supporter of his. He runs an amazing or- organization called ARF, Animal Rescue Foundation. And uh, got my dog Shady from there. Even before I knew Tony, got my dog Shady from there because I just thought it was such a great, great organization. And uh, man, we sat down for an hour and a half. This dude gave me gold. You want to talk about inspiration. You want to talk about surviving tough times and picking yourself up and dusting yourself off and going back and kicking ass. This dude dropped some fucking knowledge, man. It was awesome. It was a great conversation. We covered his whole life, his whole, a lot of his career. And, uh, you know, for all you baseball nerds, if you're expecting a bunch of baseball talk, this, isn't, this wasn't about that. You know, I'm not the biggest baseball nerd out there. I, uh, you know, I follow baseball. I kind of know the, the, the rock stars of the, and I knew a lot of the guys when he was manager, especially on the Oakland days, Jose Canseco, Ricky Henderson, Mark McGuire. But, you know, I wanted to talk to him about stuff that he didn't really talk about and doesn't get to talk about. So it was a really great conversation. Uh, before we get into that, this podcast is brought to you by nuclear blast records the premier heavy metal label on the planet earth got all kinds of good shit coming out of there including machine head uh it is also brought to you by gas digital network they are the ones who are distributing this podcast for me they are an awesome company and i'm they are killing it for me holy shit they're killing it they're doing a great job um and then it's also brought to you by caveman foods caveman foods is a paleo based food delivery service based out of Walnut Creek. I got turned on to them by the folks over at Diablo Barbell, which is the gym that I go to in Concord. Shout out to Ted and Andrea and Jen. They're awesome. It's kind of transformed my life. And uh, they had some food there from this company, Caveman Foods. And I tried it and I was like, this is really good i don't eat 100 percent paleo paleo but i definitely back this and the stuff is really healthy in case you don't know paleo paleo means avoiding grains and legumes like beans dairy and highly processed foods and limiting starchy produce and sugar this way of eating is inspired by foods that were plentiful to our pre-agricultural ancestors Their food philosophy is about clean eating, no compromise on taste, paleo approach. It's also paleo certified. So these are certified paleo ingredients, some of the best in the 21st century as far as the processing methods. Uh, They build their foods. It's a meal plan. So you, you can pick whatever plans you want. If you're vegetarian, they've even got a paleo one for that. It just means that you're eating more, uh, eggs and seeds and stuff so when they build their diet plan around you you are eating lean meat eggs nuts seeds fruit and vegetables uh, that we feel stronger sharper and more resilient when we're eating like this no compromise on taste our bodies crave health but processed foods can hijack our hunger cues our number one priority is making snacks that taste so good that you won't be tempted by junk food made from ingredients you can't pronounce the paleo approach again is the paleo diet avoids foods that are highly processed include dairy legumes beans grains and artificial ingredients that weren't easily accessible to our earliest ancestors aka cavemen and cave women so our bodies can thrive instead of dealing with 
foods they weren't built for. Head over to cavemanfoods.com. Once again, cavemanfoods.com and check out what they got. So right now, I'm going to take you to my interview with the legendary three-time World Series winning Hall of Famer baseball managing legend Tony La Russa. I wanted to start off the interview with Slump Busters. Did a young, <laughs> unmarried, fresh out of high school, right onto the cup, or no, into the Kansas City A's. Legend has it that during the 70s and the 80s, if a, if a player was in a slump, he would go out and find the nastiest, gnarliest baseball groupie and end his slump, so to speak. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of fiction there, you know, a lot of exaggeration. I think <clears throat> what you found out was that if you went out with someone and the next day you got two hits, then you were going to call her again. Right. <laughs> right. But, uh, no, I, I don't think – as bad as a slump is, you know, looking for something nasty and yeah. in, in the morning you wake up and you go, oh, <laughs> that, that, that was a good answer. Right. Awesome. Awesome. I wanted to talk to you about, uh, I wanted to start off with comedy. You know, I've, I've been to five of your ARF uh, stars benefit, stars to the rescue benefits, and you always have comedians there, which I think is so awesome you know like i love that you bring musicians there but and maybe because i am a musician but my favorite part of <laughs> of the thing is watching the comedians and i remember the first one that i did it was like it was like two day it was two nights and it was comedy one night and the music the next night and robin williams headlined Whew. robin williams headlined and i was up in the balcony with you and he, we were standing next to each other and he came out and I, I don't know why I thought this. It was like a, it's a charity event for animals. And you know, there was a lot of older people in the audience. I just assumed that he was going to tone it down a little bit. And he just came out. It was brutal. It was savage and so fucking funny. And he was just so, uh, he didn't hold back at all. And I, and I love that. And you and I sat there just cracking up like, holy shit, like hands to face. Oh my God. What, um, comedy seems like it's pretty important. And you said something to me that night and you said it to me a couple of times. And I, and I absolutely agree with it. That comedians can see something in us that we can't see ourselves, you know, that they have this way of kind of, you know, seeing something. And I, I wanted you to, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. In many ways, I think uh, comedians are some of the smartest people I've ever run into. <clears throat> you know, you look at their material, especially if they've been successful for a lot of years. I mean, they got to keep, keep coming up with these routines, and they create them out of their minds. They see things in, uh, in average, everyday life, and they, they twist and turn to it's hilarious. So <clears throat> not many of us have brains like that, smarts like that. Yeah. Now, if you talk about Robin Williams, probably the smartest person that uh, that ever been around. <clears throat> and I know my wife, Elaine, and I echoed that because we had an opportunity one time to go to a dinner uh, with, with like four or five couples. And <clears throat> every subject that was discussed, because other people there were from science or whatever, a writer. Oh, okay. And every subject, Robin was right on time with depth. <clears throat> so when I think about a comedian, I'm always intimidated because I think they're smarter. Right. You know, I, I think they're, uh, for one thing, don't ever try to get into one of them with you because oh, they're going right? to put you away and oh. <laughs> where, you, where you feel like you dig a hole. So, uh, you yeah, know, our shows always have comedians. Uh, it's, it's a nice break from the music, but I think the most important point to make is <clears throat> their intelligence and, and how they can translate what happens in life and make it funny is uh is a gift and and i admire that gift and <clears throat> robin is the king of of gifts the ps to, uh, to, that i would add to that is <clears throat> you know in in over the years you gotta be really nasty to make people laugh i mean you gotta you know you gotta talk about you know uh sex in a way that that uh almost makes your skin crawl you know and, and you have to use foul language 
and people laugh. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that that's, you know, that that's real comedy. I mean, I think that's just taking advantage of stuff that'll tickle people, but <clears throat> I stand by what I said. A comedian goes out there, you know, you can, th- you can drop some F-bombs and you can get into some stuff that's pretty shaky. But normally, if a lot of the material is, is based on stuff that we all understand, <clears throat> and you walk away and say, man, how did he or she figure that out that way that was so entertaining? Yeah, and it's true. And it go, you go, oh, oh man, <laughs> yeah. I've done that, or I've seen that, or I've felt that. Where did you, where did you guys meet? Do you remember the first time you met Robin Williams? Um, I met him uh, twice at a, at a ball game. He was there. Uh, <clears throat> which is where I usually meet people that later on you invite to help out. Mm-hmm. Uh, just that was that's the great good fortune of what I've done for a living, <clears throat> the uh, the ability to have entertainers come to ball games at an A's uh, game. Uh, one was the A's and uh, one was in St. Louis. Okay, and uh, it was just Robin Williams. I mean, every, you know, he walks around and everybody, the greatest stars were like awestruck. And you had a chance to shake his hand, you know, not, not yeah. much. <clears throat> we we uh, had a little edge because we were both in the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. And when it was with the A's, it was the A's. But when that was St. Louis, oh yeah, man, you still living there? And so he remembered. But it was really that dinner, uh, Shorenstein and, and Hayes. You know, people that have the the theaters in San Francisco. They hosted a Christmas dinner, uh, and they had five couples. And uh, Robin and his wife were there, and that was really the opportunity to, I mean, my wife, Elaine and I walked Talk. away from just thinking, oh my gosh, this guy is. Was it funny though, or was it just like a really deep conversation? Well, you know what, what he did then was, you know, he takes a conversation and then he goes for about five or six minutes into really amazingly smart tangents and, and, and then he brings it back and he goes someplace different. Nobody's okay. ever done it like he's done it. He did that several times that night interspersed with if you were you know, like one person there was involved with trying to create a, uh, a, a, a ship that would go to the moon, you know, on a commercial basis. Mm-hmm. Well, Robin was talking to him about, <laughs> about right. physics and, 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 you know, and stuff like that. So I would say that one night, uh, I say Elaine and I would say probably one of the most special nights of our lives because up close and personal. And that's where um, I never, you said, I never mentioned ARF. At the end, he mentioned it at dinner. He said, hey, how's that fun? How's, how's the charity? Because he knew about it. Mm-hmm. How's, the, how's ARF doing? I went, oh, it's doing okay. And his his wife, Susan, she said, uh, you know, he, we, we got to figure a way for him to help you. And he did. That's awesome. That's amazing. I wanted to talk about uh, you grew up in Florida. I want to go back to your early your early days. What I read is you grew up in Ybor City. That's right. Yeah. Ybor City's, man. I mean, I'm, my band's playing there. We played there a bunch of times. It's like a, <laughs> it's the party party section of town. Like it's a little, you know, at least now it's like the rough and tumble kind of place. Was it like that growing up when you were a kid? No, absolutely not. It was a, uh, <clears throat> a real uh, Italian, Cuban, Spanish, Latin American community. Um. You know, everybody, there was an Italian club, there was a Cuban club, there was a mm-hmm. Spanish club. Yeah, a lot of Cuban clubs. Yeah. That's what it is now. <clears throat> so what happened over the years, you know, and it had a small downtown area in Ybor City. Okay. So uh, it was more a community, neighborhood kind of uh, uh, area. In fact, there was, you could, you could take three or four blocks away and there would be a pasture and, and guys and, and people would have their oh, cow, okay. cows. So uh, over the years, I mean, you're talking about a lot of years. Uh, it developed more of a, you know, a, a lot of restaurants and, and a good time <clears throat> that was separate from the, you know, the downtown Tampa area. Mm-hmm. It had its own kind of feel, as you say, you know, if, if, uh, if you played there, you know, it had a different feel. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's a rock and roll part of town. Yeah. Like if you want to go bar hopping, that's your spot. Yeah. I mean, you know. Rob Flynn is not, you know, not a downtown Tampa kind of guy, <laughs> but he would said he, he, you would fit. And, uh, and, you know, now it's, you know, it's had a rebirth. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're, it's really a, an entertaining area and they've, they've done a lot to bring just a, a variety of restaurants and entertainments. And it's a nice place to visit. Were your, were your parents 
pretty tough on you? What was what were what was growing up with them like? I imagine your dad being a hard ass, but I could just be that could be my imagination. Well, my dad because you're kind of a hard ass, and so <laughs> yeah, supposedly, um, my dad was hard about working. Um, he worked six days a week, hard labor, delivering milk in those big trucks. <clears throat> uh, when I was born. Uh, my dad's Italian, Sicilian. My mother's Spanish. So uh, my, my mother had her sister. So we moved in with my aunt and uncle. We had two sons. They were like my brothers. Mm -hmm. And we is, this, in, is this World War II kind of around? 44? Yeah. You know, 45, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and my dad's working. Uh, so we, you know, there wasn't a lot of extra cash. So then we moved into the projects. We went into... My mom and dad wanted to have their own <clears throat> separation. So we went into, you know, uh, project housing where, you know, you, you had a row of small little places. You had mm -hmm. a little porch. <clears throat> so, you know, we were not raised with a silver spoon in our mouths. Yeah. But uh, my dad was exhausted on Sundays yeah. because he works so hard on Friday, um, Monday through Saturday, and uh, but totally devoted to the family. And we had, it was a large extended family on my dad's side and my mom's side on the Spanish side. <clears throat> so weekends, Sunday, you know, commonly we'd get together one side or the other. So I had a bunch of cousins and aunts and uncles, a lot of fun. Very simple. You, know, you go to a park mm -hmm. and you have some food that they all, they all, they all had, had uh, prepared and it was like picnics. Yeah. Um, and that was the, that was the day off. That was a day off. Yeah. And you would start and you started getting into baseball. Yeah. So, um, after about three years in the projects, then my dad and mom, they upgraded to where we had a uh, uh, one of a two-bedroom little flat upstairs above a service station on the main drag of Ybor City, which was Columbus Drive. Nice. So you walk down the stairs, and there was a service station. Mm -hmm. But we had our own, our own little apartment, you know, a little two-bedroom apartment. And it was three blocks, four blocks from a, from a, a recreational facility called Cascaden Park. So from, you know, from age about, uh, <clears throat> I would say, six to ten, uh, I would go to the park every summer, every day of the summer, go play baseball. Mm -hmm. It was, a, you know, it's a famous story for those that pay attention. <clears throat> we had an alley next to, our, next to the service station, which is across the street by the fire station, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, 12th Street, Nebor City, and, and Columbus Drive. Still there. <clears throat> and there was an alley where my mother, during the uh, during the days that there wasn't school, she would be throwing me baseballs, like ground balls, mm -hmm. in the air with a rock. In the alley? And I'd throw them back to my mother because my dad was working. Right. But uh, That's a good mom right there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, had, I mean, that's awesome. Well, between my mother and dad, uh, you can't, my sister, <clears throat> you can't have a better upbringing and the two of those provided for both yeah. of us. I mean, it sounds like you had a really like very you know close knit family, and that's amazing. You know, you think about the times. I know my dad was pretty uh, not emotionally there. You know, he there was a lot of holes in our walls. <laughs> you know, like when he got mad, like he could, he didn't know how to talk. He knew how to punch a hole in a wall. You know, but he was also poor. But you know, we grew up. I grew up in a in San Lorenzo, three blocks away from the trailer park that my dad grew up in. Oh. And so to us, I, you know, I always heard stories about, you know, I grew up in the, in a trailer park with no, we had no toilet, you know, like we had to shit in a bucket and take it down to the kind of community hole or whatever. And so I never felt poor, you know, because I heard th that was poor to me. We were always doing, even if we weren't by most people's standards, we were poor, right? you know, and it sounds like you've kind of had a, you know, you guys, did you ever feel poor? I mean, did you, it felt no. like your family was lo no. very loving and it was just hard working. And, and no, we, you know, we had, we didn't have extras, but we had what we needed. Uh, and, and most of it was because my dad worked so hard. Uh, you know, one thing, a uh, couple of my cousins that were like brothers, you know, their dad uh, got started and he would be done like three or four in the afternoon. My dad, I mean, two or three in the afternoon, my dad would be done later. So, uh, Sundays was his day of just restore his, 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 uh, decompress. Energy. Yeah. Decompress. So I am not handy at anything, but my, my uncle was very handy and, and taught my, my cousins, you know, how to change oil in a car and stuff like that. Okay. 
And I never begrudged it because I knew how hard my dad worked. Yeah. So what I grew up learning was we had our very tight, my sister and I, my, my mom and dad, the extended family on both sides, that when they got together, it was true family, a lot of love, you know, a lot of characters that we enjoyed mimicking. Uh, what do you but, mean? Well, because, you know, they, they all like, like their oh, characters in the family. Yeah. 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 You know, <laughs> like they, making fun of them or yeah, copying their accent or something. Yeah. yeah. But the, the what one, was your, who was the funnest one to make fun of? Or my uncle Johnny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Well, I remember one time, he, you know, he, uh, we were at this place called Lori Park and there was a little pool area and somehow he slipped into the pool and he was smoking a cigar and, and he kept holding that cigar up out of the water while he was, <laughs> while he was drowning, you know, <laughs> he was just, but, uh, the, the the most common part of both families was the love of baseball. Yeah. I mean, they loved, uh, in Ybor City, it was a famous Hall of Famer, uh, Al Lopez, who was an outstanding catch in the big leagues and a manager. He would come home during the winters. We all got to know him. Baseball, I mean, the other sports didn't exist. It was all about baseball. Yeah. So at 10 years old, <clears throat> then my dad, you know. The, I mean, I think for most people back then, baseball was the Right. The sport of America. Yeah, the national pastime. Yeah. So at 10 years old, then we made the move to West Tampa where we got a little house with a yard. Awesome. And, uh, and, and right down the alley was a uh, 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 post-248 you know, veterans hall where they had parties and dances. Mm -hmm. And across the street was another baseball park. So you talk about a guy that, that loved the game that had every opportunity every summer. I mean, I'd, I'd go at nine o'clock in the morning, come back at five, spent the day park. And I'm talking, now I'm only across the street Yeah, playing these, these games. And, uh, are you playing with older kids at this point or is it still people in your same age group combination? You know, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I developed some skills and, uh, you know, I ended up signing a contract. So I, I was, I was, I had some talents. So I quite often play with older, older kids, but, uh, I mean that, that helps you a lot too, you know, especially like 10, if you're playing with a 14 year old, he's yeah. starting to turn into a man. You're well, still probably a gangly kid. Well, there's a famous player. His name is Lou Pinella, mm -hmm. who was a, uh, had an outstanding career with the Yankees, rookie of the year at one time, Kansas city ended up managing uh, very, very well. And he lived, you know, like a mile down the street. Oh, wow. At, at West, you know, and he had a different ballpark. You guys were friends. Yeah, yeah, we well, he went. We were friends. Our friends. He ended up going to the Catholic school, and I went to the public school. So okay. the games. He was a year older than I was. So the games that we played at that Cascaden Park, overflowing crowds, five, six thousand people. Wow, I mean, that's the kind of fervor that. How old are you? At that time, well, you know, was in high school, so it was uh, 15, 16, 60, 17. Fuck, that's crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, you got the bug. Yeah, yeah, you're play, you're 15 and you're playing to crowds of five, six thousand people. So here's a PS for you. That's thrilling. Right? Just to show you the uh, the, uh, the devotion and the uh, the sacrifices. Now we didn't have a lot of extra cash, and so during the summer, I asked my father, if, "Hey, do you want me to try to find some work, bringing a little money?" He says, "As long as you're serious about your baseball, I I, I want you to have every opportunity." Because it turned out his dad prevented him from following his baseball career. He had to do chores. And, and so um, I spent my summers, you know, playing on three different teams, developing my talents because my wow. dad. So the only thing I would did, uh, it was on on Saturday morning, I would meet him on his route at about 5 in the morning, and I'd work with him until about 2, helping him, you know, shorten his day. But uh -huh. uh, Is he still delivering milk at this point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, 30, over 30 years. Wow. So you get signed right out of high school. Graduation night. Graduation night. Kansas City A's or Kansas City Athletics. That's right. And then you move? You move away? Uh, no, we were in that house. Okay. Except that, you know, the day I... mean, I you get signed, this is, this is a pretty big deal. I mean, your family must have been... Well, you yeah. must have been ecstatic. Like, this is crazy, right? Like... Yeah, because I got a little bonus, which was nice for the family. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into it because you know, a lot of the rock and roll fans are not going to appreciate this. But there's a guy named Charlie Finley, Charles O. Finley, that owned the Kansas City A's. Okay. <clears throat> and in those days, you could go out and recruit. There was no draft. Okay. So I, when I graduated from high school that night, went home, 
and there and there were 18 teams that made offers to, for me to join them. Wow. So, so they were ever, you were like, you were a hot commodity. Yeah. People were scouting you. Yeah. I had a big, you know, I was a good high school player. And so Charles Will Finley, uh, ended up signing guys like Catfish Hunter, Blue uh-huh. Moon Odom. They became the Oakland A's who won three championships. Yeah. I was one of the guys that he signed. Okay. So the day after I signed, two days later, I'm on a plane and they actually flew me to LA to join the big league team just to work out. So from that, from that point, every summer I'm gone. Yeah, and during the winter I would come back and I would go to school because I had promised my mother that I would I would get my college education. Was there some was there some uh, anxiousness on your family's part? I mean, here you are, you're 18. All of a sudden, it's seven, like, oh my seven. god, you're 17. <laughs> you're gonna go to you're gonna go away like no, you know, not necessarily certainty. Was there or were they just completely supportive? That's a great question, Rob, because. Uh, my dad was excited. I was excited to start playing pro ball. <clears throat> I was a skinny 17-year-old. I probably would have been better. I had a college scholarship at Florida State. <clears throat> My mother really was insisting that I go to college. Yeah. Um, structurally, you know, letting my body develop, I probably should have gone to college. But we couldn't pass up the money. It was, yeah. a, nice, it was a nice bonus for those days. Um, so the, the result is that uh, as my body was growing, the first six years I played, five years I had – I broke things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Knee, back, elbow, you know, dislocated shoulders. <clears throat> Mostly because I was just skinny you and weak. You broke your back? Yeah, t- or tore a muscle in my back. Okay. But after, you know, so six years, I played 16 years, the last 10 years, I really stayed healthy. Mm-hmm. Aches and pains, but, uh, and that's the one thing that uh, I, I recognize the love of baseball because with that start, all those injuries, why did I hang in there? Because I love of the game. Yeah. And then later on it translated into what I became as a manager. So you get so do you so you go to train in LA no, right out of no. Tampa and then then are you do you move to Kansas? No, no, no. I mean, no. I'm, you got to start in those days. I just they just took me to LA cuz that's where the Kansas City team was playing. Okay. So they could see this young gotcha. Young gotcha. talent, just see what I looked like. All right. They assigned me in those days the, the minor leagues was class D, C, B, A, AA, AAA. So I got assigned to <clears throat> the Florida State League, which is back home uh-huh. at Daytona Beach, Florida. Okay. So, you know, made a couple, three trips into Tampa where all the family came out. You know, mm-hmm. one day I got three hits. Next time I made three errors. You know, it was – so that that started my minor league career. I went uh, – I was in 62. The first time I got to the – well, this is another tangent, but because I signed for a bonus, the next year – the major league team has to decide to expose you or, or or protect you on the big league team. So at age 18, I was a major leaguer. Holy shit. It is holy shit. That's be- crazy. Because there is a, uh, uh, a historical fact here. I became the first 18-year-old in major league history to start a game at shortstop. Wow. There have only been two others since then. And, and one time there was a question on Jeopardy. There were three guys – that started a game at age 18, the answer was two pearls and a turd. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, uh, Robin, Robin Yan, the Hall of Famer, Alex Rodriguez, and Tony the Turd. <laughs> Tony the Turd. So then the next year, after you pay your, you know, you sit in the big leagues, I ended up getting 44 bats. Yeah. The next year, then I went back to the minor leagues for several years. Okay. And then, and then you go back to the major leagues. And I earned my way back in 68, mm-hmm. and that was, you know. Uh, and you're still on Kansas City at this point, right? Or, no, na- or is it Oakland now? That was the year that Kansas City A's became the Oakland A's. Okay. So technically, I was on the team that played the first game at Oakland Alameda Coliseum. Governor Reagan threw out the first pitch. Oh, man. That's some <laughs> history right there. Yeah. it's yeah. That's some history right there. So now you're living in Oakland. You moved to Oakland. No, I'm just there for no, the summer. Just there for the summer. Gotcha. All season back to Tampa. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So you're staying like an apartment or something. Right. You're a you're a single man. Right. You're 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 you know the the rock and roll. You know this is '68, so kind of going into the '70s. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> Did Tony Larusa ever partake? And I mean, we've heard so many stories now. You know, Mickey Mantle getting the blowjob <laughs> under the bleachers. We've heard Doc Ellis. You know. Pitching a no hitter while frying on acid and all this craziness, was that 
Is that going on? Was it exaggerated? Does it make great folklore because it's 50 years old now? Or was it, was 60s, 70s baseball like that and just kind of renegade and crazy like that? No, I w- there was a lot of uh, mayhem. Yeah. Yeah, there was stuff that, you know, in, in the, you know, the bullpen that's kind of segregated from the, the dugout and the rest of the field. You know, there might be a side door and somebody get a, a female in there during the game. Oh, yeah. <laughs> partake, you know. But. <laughs> and they're in the A's games? Uh, no, I'm, or I'm not. Or just no, in I, general. I, I wouldn't say the A's because yeah. the A's, no, the A's bullpen is right there where you can see it. Right, right. You can't do it there. Right. <clears throat> Other ballparks. Yes. But uh, now this is going to, you're going to hear the sound of people clicking this podcast off. When I say, <laughs> I've never gotten into drugs. No. Never gotten into drugs. You're not, not even like weed or anything? No. No? No, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I, I've never even been embarrassed to admit it. I don't know. It just, interestingly, my father and mother were, uh, when they met in Tampa, they met at a cigar factory. So I was raised around cigars. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Do you I, hate cigars? No, I know. I love the smell. <laughs> okay. Because, but but I, I've, you know, I've never smoked a cigarette. It just, it had no, it's got right. no interest to me. And, <clears throat> and I always played clean. Mm-hmm. You know, even when there were greenies, I, I, I was such a maniac about playing. I could fire myself up. I mean, I'm getting fired up to do this show. So. What are greenies? Uh, you know, the, the diet pills. That got oh, you, right. Yeah, they, yeah like speed or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That was pretty common there and for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it was, you mean back then it was like, you hear about the Beatles and you hear about Elvis and you know, like everybody was just popping greenies to, you know, keep on going and touring or whatever. Well, and you the play Beatles baseball. playing for 10 hours in Liverpool, you know, like, well, you play baseball 162 games a year. I mean, it's, it's brutal it's schedule helpers. Yeah. You need helpers. Right. Right. That's amazing. I know, I know, I know, I know some, some, some band friend of mine who never, which is amazing to me. It's always amazing to me when I hear like, like, wow, like you never got into like, good for you. You know, like, like they got into drinking maybe beers, wine, whiskey, whatever, vodka, but that they stopped there. Yeah. I, I couldn't do that. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't have that off button like they did. So it's admirable. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed of with that. Well, it's I awesome. Mean, I, I can see the respect diminishing before my own eyes as you're looking at me like I'm geez, what a, no. <laughs> what a <laughs> square <laughs> piece of shit this guy's uh, we know we know you were we're, you, we know you were a rager <laughs> oh. I uh so so from there you go to a couple other teams you go to Atlanta you go to the Cubs and then at some point you does do you make the decision to stop playing or does someone make that decision for you or are you just going man i had a really rough two years i'm feeling banged up i i need to think about doing something else <clears throat> you know the truth is <clears throat> and a lot of my family talk about it all the time uh when I signed, you know, as a really good prospect, actually, as at age eighteen, in those forty-four bats, I got eleven hits, so I had two fifty in the big leagues. Yeah, so I was a phenom. Shortly thereafter, playing slow pitch softball during the winter with my high school buddies, I tore the tendon in my throwing arm. Oh, in the off season. Yeah, in a stupid, stupid way, and that ended an important part of my career from instead of having being a shortstop with a really good arm. Uh, in those days, by the way, all they did was put your arm in a sling and let it repair. So you had a lot of, you know, scar tissue. Mm-hmm. So I had a sore arm the rest of my, uh, 15, 14 year career. I was 16 years, 14 years. I played with a sore arm, moved to second base. And I was just flipping the ball. I became a pretty good offensive player, but my arm, you know, when you're being scouted to play in the big leagues, even when I got back to the big leagues, I sat the bench for parts of three or four years with the A's and a little bit with Atlanta, just a few days with Chicago. The guys that were coaches knew that I was there because I could catch the ball and flip it, and I was a pretty good hitter. Mm-hmm. But I could not be a productive infielder with a, with a bad arm. Yeah. So towards the end of my career, <clears throat> it was one year in uh, double A. Uh, excuse me, <clears throat> seventy two. I, and with the Braves, I, I had, didn't have a good spring, and I went to uh, AAA and International League. <clears throat> had a big offensive year. No big league time. <clears throat> Next year, I got traded to the Cubs. I went to the – made the team in spring training, got sent out. Had a big offensive year. No big league time. Why? Because 
my arm had been exposed at that point, mm-hmm. I decided I got to do some else for a living. And that's when I started going, thinking I'm going to go to law school. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was making nice money as a AAA player. So for five years, uh, I, w- I played some AAA ball. The last three years, I was a player coach. Mm-hmm. So what became obvious to everybody was at the end of that, my, my, which was my 16th year, third year player coaching, you know, my arm was disintegrating and it was time to do something else for a living. Yeah. And you're, how old are you at this point? Like 30, 32, 32. Yeah. That's young. Like that's still young. And so you leave baseball and go get, no, don't leave baseball. You just start getting your law degree. That's right. So this was, it's amazing how this all came together. I, I, you know, you take the LSAT. I applied for the three Florida schools, Florida, Miami, Florida State, got accepted. Florida, Miami said, <clears throat> we'll accept you, but you've got to be a full-time student. I was making about 15 grand playing AAA mm-hmm. or player coaching. And I thought, well, I could pay my way through school being careful. So um, Florida State allowed. And you got some money from playing for the last 16 years. No, no, I, I, that was, I didn't make enough. There yeah. wasn't anything. So Florida State said, tell you what you can do. You can enter for the fall and winter quarters. Check out in the spring, play baseball, come back. Hmm. So in the meantime, Elaine and I had gotten married. Oh, so you, okay, so you know Elaine already. All right. right. We got married, and you know, our coexistence there, she makes you know the truthful story – she wouldn't go to a mall because she knew he couldn't afford to buy anything at the mall. <laughs> so she's making her own clothes. But she, at that point, it was all about finishing law school. <clears throat> to this day, she says she was marrying a lawyer, not a, not a manager. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. How did you guys meet? I was playing baseball in Richmond uh, for the Braves when I had that big offensive year. And uh, I went into this restaurant with uh, my roommate on an off night. And, you know, we were going to go out someplace and, uh, this true story, my girls get it, Elaine, Bianca and Devin, they get a kick out of this one. We got sat at a table, and this beautiful thing walked by in, in a little short skirt, and I called the hostess over and says, is this her station? And he says, oh, no. He says, can you move us? I said, move oh, us. Oh, she's working there. She was working okay. there. Okay. Uh, so that's how I met Elaine. And, and uh, I mean, I so just, you strategically placed yourself in <laughs> in her section so that you could be. Yeah. Oh, hey, how you doing? So before I, before I left, I so said, you start flirting with Elaine yeah. at the restaurant. Yeah. So before I left, I, you know, asked for her number. Did she you know who you were? No. Yeah. She said, "Well, you know, minor league player," but she said, "I don't date, I don't date customers." I said, "Okay." Pretty soon we started dating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll see to that. Yeah, she regrets it. Did you get? Did you guys uh, switch numbers? Is that what you did? She, what was what was your pickup line on Elaine? Huh? What was your pickup line on Elaine? Do you remember? Yeah. I, I, what year were you, Miss Virginia? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> so, so wait, wait, so I wasn't Miss Virginia. I said, well, you should. You didn't. Enter, you know, I didn't enter. You should have entered, you, Miss, Miss Virginia. Oh, that's good. That was that was good right there. She didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, you're too slick. Yeah. That's great. So then, so then you guys, st- so you guys get married, mm-hmm. you're still playing. At what point does the Chicago transition happen? Yeah, this was, uh, so I, law school five years, the last three years player coaching. And, you know, we're, we're making it through, I'm going to be a lawyer. Mm-hmm. In, in fact, I did pass the bar. I took the, you know, passed the bar, I got a license yeah. in Florida. But because of the player coach, were you, I mean, were you seriously thinking that this might be your path? Well, yeah, I was going to be out of baseball. There's no doubt. I was going to be a lawyer. Yeah. Um, but as a player coach, I saw the other side. Of, you know, when you play, you're playing, you're paying attention to the manager. But when you're the manager and you're in charge, and I was a player coach, I could see the challenge of managing. Mm-hmm. And, and in this game that I loved. So, true story. I graduated uh, my last year in uniform was 77. <clears throat> At the end of the season, September, I was going to graduate from law school in March. Mm-hmm. Elaine and I talked. And, you know, as a player coach, you know, she, she loved the game. Mm-hmm. And she was like the mama to a lot of the players. So 
she, um, I said, look, why don't I get this managing thing out of my blood? And she said, sure, because it was going to be a while before you could pass the bar. So I sent the letters, and I got a job with the White Sox managing AA. That was at 1978, AAA, 1979, August. They gave me a big league job. All along, it was going to be a good fast. Fast. It's yeah. ridiculous. I mean, that's You're like the luck, a, luckiest guy that ever lived. Yeah, they just they saw something in you. So what happened was that uh, what was the what was uh, their ranking at that point? Not, they were struggling. They were yeah. horse, they were horseshit. <laughs> <laughs> that's how guys like me get jobs, like <laughs> and they fast track you. In. So, so at that point, uh, I was going to be a manager just to get out of my system, going to be a lawyer. Yep. And all here it is, and we both agreed. You know how many. Three, three years, four years of this, and then enough. You've, you've exhausted your dream. Yeah. And sure it is part of it. In my second year, they offered me a chance to uh, manage in the major leagues. Elaine is pregnant with Bianca, and she's only a month away from delivering. Oh. And as it turns out, we both decided, you know, if you say no, you'll never get another shot. We moved to Chicago. She has a baby in Chicago. She has Bianca in Chicago. 33 years later, you know, that, that's what I, that's what I did. And, yeah. and it's important to say, Rob, is, cause you know her <clears throat> when you're in baseball like that, especially when you're such a suspect manager candidate and you're hanging on by your fingernails. Yeah. There's no safety net. There's no safety net. It's a huge, Bianca's it's born, a huge gamble. You guys are taking yeah. to do that. Bianca's born two years later. Uh, Devin's born. Yep. So all the time in those early years where I'm, I mean, I could be fired tomorrow, threatened to be fired. And all the rest of the 30 years. Did you say I'm getting threatened to be fired? Oh, well, I mean, yeah. I mean, when you look. Like when regularly? You, oh, yeah. It, it happened. Especially yeah. when in Chicago, sure. Because I, I mean, there had no track record. The, there was never, ever extended family. El- Elaine's folks lived in Virginia. Mine were in Florida. Yeah. So this is the, uh, it's kind of the tragedy. Yeah, so there's, that's tough on her. Like she's oh, raising game? the kids yeah, alone. I, well, it's a 162 game season, 81 games. You're on the road. Yep. The 81, you're home. You leave at 12, you come back at 12. Yeah. I mean, it's a, and then you have four months of off season. So the, the, the hero, the champion in our family is for whatever baseball has become. You know, I'm a hall of famer. Yeah. Is, is Elaine? Cause at any point, she and she and the girls could say, hey, enough's enough. And she paid some unbelievable dues. And uh, the sacrifices that she made were just legendary. And um, one of the, the pluses is that, you know, she has, she bonded with her daughters like, you know, the, the, the three musketeers. Right. You know, yeah. they, they have a wonderful relationship. But um, that's why, you know, yeah. Uh, she any, is. She's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, there ain't anything that she can ask. So I would. Uh, yeah. the best. Shout daughter. out to Elaine. I love Elaine. She's yeah. amazing. And she's she, amazing. She's the greatest. And rock your and daughters. Roll, greatest rock and roll fan in the country. I'm telling you, man. She knows her metal. That's. You know, I wanted to ask you something about your Chicago time because you told me this amazing story one time when we were hanging out at the after party for Arf, and uh, I know that you and Ozzy Smith had a uh, tense relationship. I don't know if what what the right word is, but. Uh, you guys, I, I don't, I don't exactly know what went on, but you told me that you were saying he was being a pain in your ass, and you told me this story about uh, you took him and some other players over to go watch Michael Jordan because you felt like like he needed a kick in the ass. Like, hey, t- would you mind telling that story? Because it was I've told this story to my son because it was such a great story. Well, it was St. Louis, not not Chicago. Oh, was it St. I got gotcha. Yeah, so, I, so I started in Chicago. <clears throat> and, and and nice background for it was, you know, I had a couple, three great players that are older than me. One of them was Carlton Fisk, a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. Greg Luzinski, Jerry Kuzma, these guys are legendary. So, and they were, you know, towards, you know, you know the last part of their career, still very good. So I, I you know, I, I was challenged as a young guy by great players that were, you know, going to the you know the back half of their career. Is that weird being a younger oh, yeah. manager than yeah. The, yeah, like they don't want uh, to respect that because of your age or You know, I was it, it, that's why Rob when you look back I don't know how I survived it. I, I, I but I was one was I was never afraid 
I wasn't afraid to be the manager. I wasn't afraid to have a tough conversation. I wasn't afraid to make decisions. What I was afraid of was to not take my best shot and have regrets later on. And I think because I, I wasn't afraid, you know, that, that translated to the players, hey, this guy, he's, he's nuts. He, he shouldn't be this ballsy, but he is. Then I go to Oakland. And you know, had Reggie in his last year of his career, Don Baylor, these great stars. Yeah, huge <clears throat> Canseco, McGuire, huge yeah. p- personalities. So by the time I got to St. Louis, my first year there was Ozzy, who was a great player, and he was right at the end of his career. Um, in fact, that was his last year, and you know he became a Hall of Famer. Is a Hall of Famer. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, my first year we had a bunch of young guys. They were really talented, but. You know, they were stumbling and fumbling, you know, didn't really understand the dedication that you had to put forth to be special, to make your talent skills, your productive, competitive winning player. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and Ozzy, you know, Ozzy, they knew Ozzy, so they were more drifting to Ozzy. And Ozzy wasn't, and and I had used him as as kind of a part-time player, which he resented. Mm -hmm. So Ozzy wasn't going to cut me any favors, hey, Trust this guy. Right. So it was a tough time. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, I, I realized because of, here again, I mean, I've been so fortunate with everything in my career. I was a manager in Chicago. The owner of the White Sox is the owner of the Bulls, Jerry Reinsdorf. So during my time there, I had met Michael. I had gone to practices. I had met um, the, Phil, you know, the great, their, their great coach, you know, Phil, um, I'm darn a blank, you know, Phil. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. It's really bad that I'm drawing a yeah. <laughs> But anyway, you know, he's got more rings than anybody. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so I had seen Michael practice. And man. And this is like prime Michael Jordan, like oh yeah, this the is legend. Same, this is the Bulls of the time. Yeah. So now I go to St. Louis. And I'm watching our guys half-stepping and thinking, hey, I'm trying. And hey, let's have some fun instead of grinding and relenting. So I had the thought. And it turns out we're going to Chicago. The Bulls were in the uh, playoffs against the Heat. There was an off day. So I call over Phil Jackson. So I talked to Mr. Reinster, the owner, talked to Phil. That was good. Yeah, I'm glad I pulled it out. It's embarrassing. <laughs> That's good. Phil Jackson. I mean, you know, he's got like yes. 11 rings. Yeah, I know <clears throat> Phil Jackson. So um, I call over and I said, look, man, I see where you're practicing. It was after the first two games of the Heat Series. They're going to practice and then go to Miami. Right. Can I bring these guys over just to watch? Because they need to understand what what a practice is, what Michael, and to, to this day. Because this is like discipline and focus. I'm telling like you. You've I, I, never I, seen. I'll explain it. So they said yes. So I brought all the young guys plus two veterans. I brought Ozzy and I brought Willie McGee. He's a great pro. Mm-hmm. And, I brought, and I brought four of our five of our studs. <clears throat> So we show up, first of all, walk in there and right away, hey, Tony, how are you? Come on up. Right away, I can see those guys. Hey, maybe this guy into the Yahoo that we, that we think he is. <laughs> so if you go up over the practice facility, there's a, there's a platform. Mm-hmm. So the guys, you know, they're kind of just strolling around. They're, you know, acting like they don't give a shit. And I'll come the Chicago Bulls, like in the midst of a championship run. And... uh so we're up there. Phil blows a whistle, like an hour and a half practice, which I had seen before. <clears throat> I've heard it from experts. Michael Jackson is the greatest practice player in the history of the game. So they saw Michael from Jordan. Them, Mike, Michael, yeah. yeah, Michael Jackson. That was good. Michael Jordan. I'm glad you're paying attention, brother. So an hour and 15 minutes. It's like 15 minutes, five times. Different drills. As soon as Phil blows a whistle to a new one, first guy on the line is Michael. Hustling and playing it like it's game seven of the NBA finals. Right. And if anybody's half-stepping, hey, you know what's at stake here? I mean, he's all over their ass. And so guys gravitate to the star. And your star is setting the best example. What are you going to do? I'm, I got to get to where Michael is with effort. Right. And, and with effort. And what comes, an inspiration. It was, to watch it and to watch those guys respond. And if one guy backed off, look, come on now, you know what's at stake. Come on. Watching him take charge and, and lead the way. After about... 10, 15 minutes, all these cool guys, they're leaning over the railing, just eyes are big, just awestruck. 
with how hard Michael's playing. He's playing it like it's the seventh game of the NBA Finals. So when the hour 15 minutes of practice is over, Phil had said, come down to the weight room <clears throat> so that you, can, you know, guys can meet the players. So we go down there, and I'm in the back, and all the guys are here. And, and here comes Michael and, and Scotty and, and all those guys. And uh, first of all, Michael walks by all, all our studs. Hey, Tony gives me a big hug, man. Good to see you, man. <laughs> How's life in nice. St. Louis? And nice. I, and I can see all these guys saying, wait a minute. In fact, I brought Who's this motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I brought, we had a great, great coach, coolest dude around, guy named George Hendrick was our hitting coach. So he was, he was there too. And that was a day, I think, when they said two things. One, say, hey, man, maybe there's something to this Yahoo that we're not getting. <clears throat> and if Michael thinks this guy's okay, then maybe this guy is okay. I mean, you, I mean, you just got blessed by the Pope practically right. in front of right. your studs. And literally, that's the day that our guys started saying, you know what, I'm going to listen, because I had great coaches. We're going to start listening, and sure enough, this was like, I'll bet you it was like May. By June, we were in contention, and through a hard, sum, through a hard summer, we ended up winning the, the division. Yeah. It's a great story, and I owe it all to Michael and Phil and, and Jerry. For I love that story. I've yeah. told that story more than a few times. It's such a it's such an inspiring, I've told it to my kids when he was having like, you know, just, he was having his own slump and playing. And I was like, you gotta, you know, you listen to this and take, take the notes from it, you know, take those nuggets of information from it. You know, as we speak, I even think I've never thought about it till right now. I know they taped the practices. I'm going to call Mr. Ryan Storm and say, do you still have an archive? Oh, wow. Of a practice awesome. So that people could see. Right. Michael Jordan practice. Yeah. I don't know if they would release it. Right. But it would be, you know, like a one picture is worth how many words? Yeah. We can talk to your son all you want to. But if you see it yourself. Yeah. you never forget it. Yeah. Let's go back a little bit in time. So you eventually, so you controversially get fired from Chicago. Hmm. And then you end up going to the ace and you make it to the world series three times. First time you lose mm -hmm. second time win, win third time, win lose, lose third time you lose. So the second time was 89, the sweep the battle of the Bay. And let, and let me just say, your your San Francisco, your Oakland A's swept my dad's San Francisco yeah. Giants. Yeah. Well, you know the Giants. He was very upset about this. I had to say this for him. Well, you know, when, when, when you're how Oakland, dare you? When you're in Oakland A versus San Francisco, you know you're you're a second class citizen. Right. You know the paper. Oh my God. Everything's totally. about, you know you're you're on the east side of the bay and yes. So we couldn't afford to lose that one. Yeah. You know we had to beat him. Um, well, yeah, let me go back a, miss, a second though, because the thing that I, that I wanted to ask you about is that I think, you know, like it's a fucking, I mean, the effort and determination and the discipline just to get to the world series, this is 88, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yeah. And then you get there and lose. Yep. I think, you know, whatever that mentality that you lose, I think it's even harder to get back into the world series after you lose, you know, like you made it that far and then, ah, fuck, I didn't get there. Like, how do you pick up the pieces and start over again? You know, the next year, like you just, we're still good enough. We still got it. Like it's got to shatter your confidence in some small way or big way. Well, it, 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 the best answer, it pissed us off. <laughs> you know, in fact, that that's one of the things, it was like, you know, you have credo that you learn. I never liked, you know, say there's a setback. Yeah. I never liked frustration, disappointment, oh, and mercy. Because those kinds of responses just ooze energy out of your body. If something bad happened, I like pissed off. Get angry. Yeah. Because you get adrenaline. I'm going to do something about it. The, uh, the 1988 
uh, Oakland A's, we won 104 games. It's nuts. And then we played the Boston Red Sox in the championship series, and Boston is really good. We beat them four in a row. We had a wonderful, outstanding team. The Dodgers. Is played. this the is this the like Conseco, yeah, McGuire, oh, yeah, yeah. The Ricky Henderson. Guy, the only guy we didn't know. The only guy we didn't have was Ricky. He came okay. next year. We had 104. We had a really outstanding team, it's outstanding crazy. pitching, yeah. everything. Um, so on the National League side, the Giants. I mean, excuse me, the Dodgers are playing the Mets, and everybody thought the Mets had the best team, and the Dodgers upset them, and they're hurt. So sure enough. Here are the mighty A's going to play the, the Dodgers, and a couple of our guys insanely say, we're disappointed we wanted to play the best team. So Tommy Lasorda, the, you know, the, the fanatical uh, inspiration man, he just pumps those guys up beyond their What do you mean by that, the fanatical inspiration man? Yeah, Tommy was a, you know, was a, a guy who, 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 would, who would motivate you with great speeches. He is a great after-dinner speaker. He's, okay. got, he's, got, every, he's got lines for everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he, this was made to order. The great Oakland, they, they think we're this and that. And this was, by the way, the scheme is historic. We play the, the mighty A's are playing game one. Conseco, it's a grand slam. We're winning four to three in the ninth inning. We've got two outs. Eckersley's on the mound, the great closer. The guy walks. Gibson comes up with the, with the limp and hits the home run. He wasn't, it's the only at bat he took the whole series. He had this busted, bad leg. He hits, a, he hits a, a crazy, you know, he just flips a two strike and we lost. Well, they also had a guy named Earl Hersheiser who was having a great year. He pitched the next day. They beat us in five games mm. and they were hurt. Yeah. And Gibson played. It was one of the great, like in your mind, they shouldn't have won. Like no, this shouldn't no, we happen. Had the, we, we had the best team. And, and I personally, you know, the manager, were you pissed at your players for saying that? I was pissed. For, <laughs> you know, cause we don't disrespect. It was a stupid right. thing okay. to say. Gotcha. So the manager's responsibility more than anything else is to get guys ready to play. Yeah. And fire them up. And we didn't, I, you know, I didn't get them ready to play because we got our ass beat. So the response was what I mentioned before. We got pissed off. I got pissed off. Our coaches are pissed off. The players are pissed off. We showed up in spring training the next year. And that first meeting, there's actually a picture of it in this, uh, me talking to the guys, and, and the guys were leaning forward listening. And we all agreed that we were going to be on a mission. <clears throat> so this great bunch of guys had that we were never going to be denied getting into October. And in the middle of the summer, Sandy Austin traded for, for Ricky Henderson. So now we have one of the great teams of all time. Yeah. And we played. Uh, actually, the Angels gave us a tussle, but we won. We beat – Toronto in five, and now we've got the uh, playoffs against the Giants. To their credit, they had a really good position player team, but their pitching was hurt, and that's one reason it was four games and out, and we scored a lot of runs. Yeah, They just couldn't shut us down. Let's talk about the earthquake that happens <laughs> in the middle of it all, though, because I'm, well, I'm, I'm watching it. Me and, my, uh, me and my girlfriend at the time, we were on coming down from a night of hard partying <laughs> like we're really hard partying we're out of our minds on speed and and the next thing i know i'm watching and the whole my whole apartment starts shaking earthquake game shut down i mean bridge collapse what your family's there i would imagine yeah. right like yeah. what is going on like what's the vibe is everybody just terrified is confusing you get, the power got lot the power went out yeah yeah it was like, you know, five something in the afternoon because yeah. it's eight o'clock in the East Coast. Um, game two of the World Series? Game, game three. three. Yeah. Yeah, we were up two zip. Yeah. So we had won first two games in Oakland. And Roger Craig was a manager of the Giants, outstanding veteran, you know, feisty, you know, you know, very competitive. And, and so his response to getting beat, oh, okay. In those days, Candlestick Park was a tough place to play. The fans were mean and yeah. loud and. And so he said, cold. Well, yeah. <laughs> so Roger said, okay, they got us, but wait till we'll, we'll get even. They haven't experienced anything like our fans getting on them. And so we're, it's five something in the afternoon. We're getting ready for the introductions. I'm sitting in the dugout with the coaches. Some guys are playing catch. Some guys are doing some sprints. Mm -hmm. 
we're three or four minutes away from me being introduced on the lines. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I, you feel this pounding on what I thought was the, the dugout, you know, those metal dugouts they had. My first response was, you know, this is Roger. He fired up the fans. This is going to be one loud. In fact, in our meeting before the game, I said, fellas, you know, we got to just shut everything out and play ball because this is, they're going to be nasty and loud. And that's what I thought it was. I thought it was just the fans getting it going before they even had introductions. Stomping on the ground or yeah. something. And then I look up, and you see the, the big light poles just shaking back and forth. Right. And you think, uh-oh. And then you realize you got this, you know, seventh magnitude <clears throat> earthquake, and people with portable radios are starting to, you know, talk from the stands about the you know part of the bridges down. And Yeah, this is before cell phones. This is before right. the Internet. Nobody. Right. You know, you're probably just getting, yeah, over the radio, you're getting yeah. your information. Yeah. So they got, I mean, it was just a terrifying night because you didn't know how the, the ballpark was set. You know, and you got 50,000 people there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a way to describe just the uh, the response and how locked up everything got. They called the game, you know, like in, by, by seven. They said, can't do anything. Yeah. So we all boarded our buses. And we had to get back to Oakland. We went all the way around San Jose. Oh, shit. Yeah, because the Bay Bridge is to, to eight, shut to or collapsed. Eight. Part of it's collapsed. And the Cypress. Right. So it, we, left, we left seven something. We, got it, we pulled into Oakland at 1130. Oh, man. That's how landlocked. I mean, uh, the, the traffic was. Are you, are you thinking this is a good omen? This is a bad omen? Oh, no, no. <laughs> is everybody like. Well, every, everybody was just confused you know yeah what's the meaning yeah because now we you know on the, on the we heard we had radios on the car you know you're hearing about the the fires in yeah. in parts of san francisco so many people died yeah. people died and then buildings not, collapsed not just the golden gate but the you know the the interstate there the freeway oakland, collapsed in yeah. oakland yeah so you now you're really concerned about and, and what happens because we, we had a good group of guys i mean you're, you're human you're you know you got your man before you're a player I and mean, a woman so we were concerned about what was going on in the area. Yeah. The, the game and the World Series was secondary. <clears throat> and um, then we went through 10, 11 days of – the only thing that pissed us off was there was some talk about the middle of the time that the World Series should be canceled. Oh. And so I thought, you know, that's just people in San Francisco that are down over here. <laughs> <clears throat> Because, and this is how I explained to the players, and when I had my time in the meeting, I said, cancel it. I said, whatever the period is of waiting respectfully, yeah, all for that. I said, but, you know, nightly the theater is on. They're playing football on weekends. Yeah. I said, well, anyway. What, if, if, if anything, this is going to pull the cities together. Yeah, if you're, you're in cancel, well, you're gonna be, all these other entertainment things are going on. So 11 days later, uh, you know, we, uh, we came back and won two in a row. We were the world champion. Just sure there's there's a piece to the story. We wanted to respectfully not celebrate. Hmm. So there was no champagne at Clubhouse, although Dave Parker, the great, great Dave Parker, had some down parentone that he popped and, and everybody had just a tiny sip, but yeah. no no rock raucous celebration, no parade. No, wow. You I know, don't remember we, any of that. Yeah, no, oh. the uh, you know, of course our owner Walter Haas, the, the Levi Strauss Haas, Haas. But out of respect for, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that's classy. Yeah, no, that's a classy. So, hey, we can't. We're going to have a parade, and they're, they're still repairing the bridges. Yeah. And, uh, Not that it would be, like, sticking it in their face, but. It, the right, it was the wrong. Yeah. So we had a little little rally at Jack London Square. Yeah. And uh, after that, Mr. Haas, which that, was 80, that was 89. After that, through 95, he says, Tony, I mean, I, we got we got to win it because I, I really want to experience that parade. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, Mr., and Mr. Ross never asked for anything, so we were all dedicated. Came close, but never could pull it off. Yeah, what what uh what what happens when you sweep a World Series? With does the other manager uh, just hate your guts, or does he come over and shake your hand? Do you guys talk after that? Uh, you know, he shook hands. Roger was yeah. I mean, he was a pro. Yeah, but you're you know, a sweep is embarrassing. Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, the next year we we won. Cincinnati swept us. Okay. And the next time, does I got, he stick it to you then? <laughs> no, it just you know, he, he, 
you just feel like after all you've done during the season, yeah, and to get to the World Series, you have to win playoff series. Well, by the way, when I get to St. Louis and it's 2004, and we we get in, we got swept by the Red Sox. Yeah. So it makes you feel like the game is the game, and they outplayed you, but you're you're embarrassed because if you're not if you don't appear to be competitive. In the, in the biggest stage that the game provides, right? you take it personal. You know, it's just like we didn't show up, and no matter any explanation you make is an excuse. So you don't make an excuse. We just got beat, and you live with it. You got like to do. You get haunted the rest of your life. You've won three World Series. Yes. And you've been there how many times? Six. Six. I mean, three. I mean, I look at – that's the part of, that, of, the sto- of your story that is so fascinating to me, that you got there three times and lost and still – still somehow managed to you know focus your brain and yeah. focus your players and like that's what's incredible you know the, the three wins you know all due respect that's like in- unbelievable it's incredible but the three losses yeah. that it doesn't just break you down that it doesn't just make you second guess every fucking move from there and that's the part that i'm fascinated by you know like how you just put i mean i guess you just get pissed off <laughs> well, or you know, you know, Rob. That's, that's probably the, the uh, maybe the most important thing that we'll talk about on this for for anybody that's listening. <clears throat> because no matter what, whether it's your personal or your professional life, things are going to go wrong. Yeah. You, you, you know, you're going to have losses. You're going to have adversity. What's your response? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the loser response is to give in, give up. Woe me, you know, I'm not, not meant to be, and you just lose this mental edge. The proper response is to say, okay, it happened. You confront it, and here's the golden rule. You learn more from adversity than you do from success. I mean, it's been, I've, I've read that for years. It's true. You, ner- you learn more from losing than from winning. So the challenge is to get your shit together. You know, every time some negative vibe creeps into your, into your coconut, you say, get the fuck out because I'm not going to lie you in. I'm going to recognize that we got beat by the Dodgers, got swept by Cincinnati. What was wrong? And, and you do some hardcore, honest thinking, and, and you bury your soul, and, and, you, and you bury your coach's soul, and your player, player's soul, and what it would, you know, same thing can happen on your personal life, but you have to really honestly drop all pretensions, drop any excuse. If you have an explanation that makes sense, that's good. And there are explanations that why, because yeah, man, that happened and I can fix it. But if all you're doing is making excuses and you get nowhere. So I, I, uh, I know that, uh, so I don't know, maybe I, I look back at, at, at how I was raised. Maybe it was the toughness of my dad. My mother was, she was a, just a, a saint, but tough. I know that if there's one quality that I didn't realize I had <clears throat> till I, I kept playing for 16 years, even though my body was broken. Yeah. I have, I have toughness within me. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things scare me. I'm, you know, I don't like pain, but I am not afraid of toughness i'm not afraid of challenges and i and i i can be a relentless son of a bitch you know and that's that's a good you know if you if you do it properly and you and you don't get power crazy and you don't abuse anybody with it if you just use it personally to to get as far as you can get it's a good thing and what i'm telling you is and i'll repeat it because it's so important take the adversity and you learn from it yeah and it makes you better Mm -hmm. And, and even in 04, first time with the Cardinals, we got swept by the great Boston Red Sox teams. After that, 06, we won 83 games. It's a, one of the smallest numbers by division. We won the World Series. In 11, we had a magical comeback. We were 10 and a half back with 32 to play. Came back and won as a wild card team. Mm-hmm. Now, those things would not have happened, man. I repeat, those last two championships would not have happened without those losses. Yeah. As painful as those losses were, if you treat the loss and get something out of it, 
you'll have success some way, somehow. Yeah. I I had a question about um, somewhere in there, you you were drinking up to there from your young from being a young man until uh, some point, and then you got a DUI. Mm -hmm. Is this post loss of the World Series or post win of the World Series? No, that was that's probably one of the most embarrassing you know moments in my personal and professional life it's i'm sure i've lost point i lost points with my wife and daughters um you were very upfront about it yeah. very you know yeah. very apologetic to the fans very yeah. apologetic yeah, to the organization mistake. now here's uh you just celebrating too much no 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 it, it was it, it, i'll tell you the honest to goodness truth which nobody wants to hear but i'll say it and then people can get discounted Right before I went to spring training, uh, I had a little vertigo. Hmm. And I was taking some medication for it. And Lincoln attests to this. So I go to spring training in the early part of spring training. This happened in spring training. When I'm bending over to pick up balls, you know, I, I was still a little woozy. Yeah. You know, so I'm still. Like a pain pill or like a. Well, something. something in, to vertigo. counteract the right. vertigo. Yeah, gotcha. Well, by the time I got to spring training, I, I had been gotten off the medicine, but I was still you know, being very careful. Mm -hmm. So I, I think my system was that. Now, <clears throat> what happened that night was I had just spent an off day going to New York for ARF. I came back. I was exhausted. Mm -hmm. We had a long day. Um, and that night I, I went to dinner with the coaches. And when it was over going home, I stopped by a restaurant because two Italian owners of restaurants and I stopped by to say good night to him. And by the time I got to about like three blocks from where I was staying, I fell asleep at the wheel. Yeah. Did you have some more drinks at the restaurant? At Kalu on at Kalu on on the rocks. Yeah. So I really had not I wanted to know what you had. <laughs> yeah. I really had not I had a couple of Was wines. that your was that your drink back then? No, nah, it's just yeah. it's the after dinner thing, just something sweet. Yeah. So my point is that I think I was so run down and I was susceptible. Yeah. And so I was asleep at the wheel. Yeah. I mean, you're so lucky you fell asleep, stopped. Yeah. It's incredible. You know, like so much. So you, know, go, you so could I, have died. So someone I, else could have died. Yeah. So I go through all this, you know, this embarrassment. Uh, but, you know, to this day, during the season, I had a, in, in 1999, I had severe stomach issues that I thought were an ulcer. Mm hmm. And it wasn't. The, How do you not get an ulcer? The smooth, muscles, the, the smooth muscles in my stomach were irritated, I found out. And the doctor prescribed two glasses of red wine okay. after every game. All right. So, and as 99, I managed to 2011, never had another issue. Yep. So, during the winter, you know, never drink. During the summer. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, because, you know, we just don't want to set that example. Um, and then during... The summer, I'll have the glass of wine. Mm -hmm. So that it that oh, it was. By the way, it was 2007. So we were we were the world champions. And I'm walking out there, and people gave me a standing ovation, like, "Hey, man, you're one of us." You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're a fuck up just like yeah. us. <laughs> biggest problem, by far. Yeah. Biggest problem was. Uh, I think the way you handled it is probably part of the standing ovation. Like you were, you just owned it. Fucked up. You know, like you can't. Yeah. But the problem is, the biggest problem was and still is, you know, I don't, I don't think Elaine Bianca and Devin look at me the same way ever since. Yeah. Yeah, lack of trust. By the way. You quit drinking at that point, right? Yeah. And you haven't had a drop since. I'll have a glass of wine. Yeah, okay. Uh, during the season. Still. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, want, I don't want that pain. So the one lesson about adversity and – I, I, you, can, I, you can kick its ass and make it yourself better. The other one that is probably the uh, the other side of my equation that I'm sure has created a lot of the positiveness, whether it's my professional career or even the work with ARF, is trust. Yeah. You know, uh, if you think about it, I work hard. You can't you can't be a leader. If they don't trust you. Right. So I, I'm, I'm going to do what it takes to, 
to be trusted. I'll have the hard conversation. I'm going to confront you, but I'm going to show you I care. So that night with the DUI, you lose trust. And so I paid the dues for that. But the great, great majority of the rest of my life is, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be somebody you trust. Did becoming vegetarian coincide with starting ARF? No, ARF started in 91 and, and uh, we started being, I say we, Elaine and I started being uh, vegetarians back in 1977. Oh, wow. That's a long time ago. It was my last year as a player coach. I, I never forget, I came off a road trip. Elaine was there awake at like 2 or 3 in the morning. And you could tell that, you know, she, you know, she, she was emotional. She had just watched a, uh, a documentary around how veal comes to the table. And that mm. began her, her awakening about, hey, wait a minute. You know, it's not, that's, I'm not, I'm not going to do that to a little calf. Yeah. And then, and then it just, you, know, you guys are in Chicago. And then I was in, I was in New Orleans as a, as a, as a uh, player coach for okay. the St. Louis Cardinals. <clears throat> and then they just quickly, quickly became red meat and chicken and turkey. And, and, you know, Elaine is a, she's brilliant about how you can get protein in the diet. So our daughters, dancers, very active, mm -hmm. you know, Never had to have, you know, the, the the protein that you get from something that's not you know plant based. Yeah. So uh, she's she's been uh, she was a leader, uh, and it became part of it. Became as an animal rescuer. Yeah. You know you don't during want, this time. You, yeah, you don't want to be a hypocritical. So at ARF, if you have an ARF event, there's going to be non 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 meat. Yep, <clears throat> but in our in yep, our own all lives, the all that all the ARF benefits always have no meat right. trays and right. food. Yeah, so you know Elaine is vegan, plant based. You know, but I I eat eggs, I have cheese, I have dairy. Mm -hmm. When did so Elaine kind of spearheaded doing the animal rescue thing after becoming vegetarian, and then at some point in ninety one, you guys opened this amazing facility here in Walnut Creek that we're at right now. I got my dog shady from here, so our has a very special place in my heart. Well, I was raised without a, without a companion and without a dog because my no mom, animals in your house because my mom, when she was a kid, had gotten bitten by a cat. The cat got away, when she it was rabies, so she had the fourteen injections in the abdomen. Oh yes, Trauma, I've heard about this. Yes. Traumatized her, <laughs> right? So it wasn't until I married Elaine and she had a dog. It's amazing poodle. Name Yvette. Mm -hmm. An amazing dog. And she had a cat named Dinkles. <laughs> Dinkles. So we, we've been married for a long time. It wasn't until I married Elaine that all my uh, dreams of having a pet came to fruition, except I had underestimated the greatness of them. So from our first days. I mean, you didn't know. No. You had no idea what. No, I, I just thought when I, I go to you know relatives and I see their dog and. I assumed, but it wasn't until Elaine and I got together with Yvette and Dinkles. <clears throat> I knew, I thought the dogs were great. Their, Yvette was even greater. I didn't know anything about cats, and I realized they're just as great in yeah. a different way. So that started for the rest of our lives. And then um, in 91, we started ARF, but we didn't build. You know, we started out piece by piece by piece. 2003 is when we built this building. <clears throat> It's an amazing place. I love it. Yeah, I love that you guys have done this. I, I think I, Elaine's kind of, you know, like talking to you, like she's changed your life. Yeah. Like in you know, so many ways, you know, like she has, if you never would have met at that restaurant, yeah. you know, like <laughs> your life would be probably completely different. Well, there's, you know, there's so much depth to her. You know, she's a really intelligent person. She's got a lot of stuff that she pays attention to. She's really smart about it. <clears throat> A good example, Bianca and Devin, she homeschooled them. Mm -hmm. so she took that responsibility on herself. If you've been around Bianca and Devin. Smart. They're, they're smart. Yeah. So Sharp. And where did they get smart? Elaine. Yeah. And they continue to be smart. And so Elaine's interests are wide-ranging. Uh, that's why, you know, I'm actually embarrassed when I'm around her because I've got this <laughs> three or four things that, that I pay attention to and I get wholly into, and she's got three or four hundred. She's one of the biggest metalheads, a huge machine head fan. 
Yeah. No, she brought you to the war field on the on the locust tour and that's where i met you for right. the first time we mm-hmm. totally rode down after the show and uh and every time i've seen her she just she talks metal she talks oh so and so's new album oh my god i got the new sabaton i'm so into it you know she's just she's genuinely and you know some people kind of they fake it like oh yeah i like metal but like that just means they like metallica which is like yeah like being led zeppelin yeah. you know she like knows her shit can chop it up with you talk shop and that's what i think is you know it's really genuine you know she fucking loves it you know and she's there she comes to all my rob flynn and friendship like she's she's in it and it's it's amazing that she's so into music i, I mean has it rubbed off on you in any no. way like do you are you listening to, i mean i would imagine you got to listen to quite a bit of metal as a result of just yeah. being around her no i know i like i like i like music i like metal yeah um Here's the key question you ask Elaine. Animal, companion animals, and music, heavy metal. It would be, which one do you love more? <laughs> she's like, you can't make me choose that. She'd say, you can't make me choose that. <laughs> that that's how deep she's into, because she, she's, a, she's still a definite crusader for companion animals and Absolutely. euthanasia and all that stuff. I mean, she stays up till 3 or 4 in the morning communicating with, with yeah. others around the country. Absolutely. But uh, I think people would appreciate this. So if we go to a concert together and I'm staying next to her, there's her and there's one of our daughters, one of her husbands, one of her daughters, one of her husbands. Mm-hmm. And this has been true for years. I can no longer stand next to her because I stand there, you know, I got my hands in my pocket. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm kind of weaving back and forth in a little bit. And she looks at me and she says, you're fucking embarrassed. <laughs> so I have to go to the far. You're not throwing the horns. You're not no, headbanging. No, she's she's like, what I'm are just, you doing? She looks at me. She says, you're fucking embarrassing. So I have to go stand next to one of my son-in-laws. And she'll stand next to one of the girls. Yeah. So and they'll she, rock. Yeah. So they can all rock together. But I'm not going to embarrass her and hold her down with my you know, too cool, for, too cool for school mentality. You know. Did you ever come out to? Did you ever come out to music? Was that like a thing back then? Like, you know, a lot of players come out to Metallica or hip hop or whatever. No, no. Was yeah. that a thing? Did yeah, you come no, out to? Yeah, I, 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 I like music, all music. What was your? What was the song you came out to? Or the songs, the bands, Class, classic rock. Yeah, like Black Sabbath. Or... No, no, no. Class, more classic. You know, old. You know, like Sticks and Okay and, and Journey. I'll tell you a quick story in a second. I always want to learn to play piano. By the way. Okay. I never have. I want to still. So I'm the White Sox manager. There's a brand, you know, now you remember, double A, triple A, August, you're the manager of the White Sox. Mm-hmm. And I'm 34 years old. Yeah. So I go to Chicago and they Is have, that young? That's pretty young, oh, that's right? All, yeah, one of the youngest ever. Yeah. So there's a, uh, a rock station and they have a, a, a show at midnight called Zero BS. So they, they find out that they've got this young guy. He just got hired by the White Sox, and mm. we well, like, oh, I like rock and roll music. Yeah. So they asked me to go on the show at midnight, and I do. And so in between the interview about, you know, baseball and all that, they'll say, okay, you know, give me a band you like, and they would go to commercial or come back with a band. Mm. So one of them, I say, was Sticks, because when we were playing as a double-A manager, Sticks had come out with a great album, and I we, we, I'd ride to the ballpark with what, one of the players. What record was that? She's, I don't know if it's Grand Illusion or whatever it was. Okay, like Domo yeah. Arigato, Mr. Roboto, no, or something. Was, before that. Before that. Okay. So this would have been uh, 70, uh, uh, no, excuse me, yeah, yeah, 70, 78, 78 mm-hmm. probably. So we would, we would ride in this guy's van, and, and, and he would turn on Sticks, right? Mm-hmm. So that was one of our favorites. So I say sticks, and the guy plays some sticks. The next day, I'm at, I'm at Comiskey Park. Security calls on. They say, hey, there's a guy here. His name is Dennis DeYoung, and he wants to say hello. So I thought somebody said, well, you go tell Dennis DeYoung to go fuck himself. Because <laughs> I knew security, because everybody's on my ass when I show up. Hey, you were on zero, you were on zero BS last night, and half the people were... All the squares are busting your balls. Yeah, there's all the squares. Man, you can't do that. Like, hey, man, you're cool, man. You're really cool. And I thought, yeah, I'm just trying to win a game tonight, so I'm like, I can be here tomorrow. Right. So sure enough, knocks the door. I go to the door, and in walks Dennis DeYoung, the lead singer for, yeah. for Sticks. And uh, 
that began a friendship that exists to this day. He and his wife, Suzanne, had two kids. Uh, he was actually the guy that inspired the thought for Stars to the Rescue. Really? Yeah, because wow. cause he says, look, I, you know, we're friends. I'll put a, con- I'll put a concert on for you. We were mm-hmm. talking about fundraising. Yeah. This is a... Uh, the, the, uh, see, the 90, the, uh, summer of 91 they, they did uh, Conquer Pavilion so when it was over Elaine and I <clears throat> got with Dennis and Suzanne and our girls mm-hmm. and we stopped at a Denny's because it was about 3 o'clock in the morning and ate and said hey we got fundraising I'll do a concert he says maybe but you don't have enough friends to do this he says what musicians will do as you know they'll do 15-20 minutes so that so that January, did the first Stars to Rescue, and this is who we had. Dennis Young, John Fogarty. Is he not in sticks? No, he came by himself. He just did a solo, right. Dennis Young, John Fogarty. Wow. Chris Isaac, Mickey Thomas. And what we started that year was so that John and he, they, you know, we had like an all-star band. Yeah. And that's still. Oh, okay. And that became Mark Russo putting the all-star band together so shout out to mark russo yeah, he's yeah, the best the best love him so what so to this day i mean not to not to piss off the the host you know classic rock is still my favorite sure my favorite uh music that's awesome that's that's amazing do you got do you want to talk about the wounded warrior project that you're doing yeah yeah kind of wrap it up yeah so uh we started our mm-hmm. in 1991 it was just because in our county, all the nonprofits that, that complement the public efforts were full. If you find a dog on the street or a cat in the street, you can place them. Mm-hmm. And there was this incident in, 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 at uh, the Oakland, Col- Oakland Coliseum that actually happened to the cat that ran on the field. We tried to place them. We couldn't. So that winter, we started seriously thinking about maybe we could be part of the solution. Gary Bogue, the great columnist with the, with the uh, Contra Costa paper, we met with him. He says, yeah, you know what happens is you have these groups. They start three or four years, five years. They flame out because they run out of support. So Elaine and I said, we got to start it. In fact, she said, I have a name. Let's get some catch- catchy Animal Rescue Foundation ARF. So I'm the husband. I'm going to top her. I said, well, how about Bay Area Rescue Foundation? So she looks at me and says, just think about that. For a minute. <laughs> Barf. Barf. <laughs> So that was our, <laughs> and our, our mission, <laughs> people rescuing animals. Yes. So one of the benefits of being a manager is you talk to the press twice a day before and after the game. Once they're done asking you, they have notes. So once our started, we got this incredible amount of free publicity because ours going to have a spaghetti supper or a this or that, yep. trying to raise money, raise awareness. So we're, Talk about this after the game. Yeah, or before. Or before, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we would get our name in the paper, ARF. Yeah. Now, so all these other nonprofits, that, you know, you can't get a sniff. Our phone's ringing, and we realize, oh, my God. Even, like, in the first four or five months, our hotline was, you know, 30, 40, 50 calls with issues. And, man, there is a need. So now we'll get to the bring it to date. About the third year, we realized that once you preach to the choir, you have to enlarge the base. And there were a bunch of people that felt good about animals, but they were also supporting other causes. Yep. So we, we had a wonderful charter board, and we decided that we were going to have a, add a mission, a complement to the mission that was people rescuing animals, rescuing people. And we knew that any companion animal has a therapeutic value, even if in a family. You know, you bring your dog oh, or yeah. cat, you know, they, you feel animals better. Animals are awesome. We got a zoo at our house. That's right. <laughs> so we started out, our first one was victims of violence, better women abuse kids. Mm. And we got involved there. And then pretty soon, little by little, we worked in the hospitals. Uh, and, you know, we had to bring the animals that we called the pet hug pack that's carefully, you know, uh, trained so that somebody can yank the ear and it's just lovable. Okay. So, like last year, I think it's like 179,000 people in, a, in, a, in our county were visited by our groups at senior homes, you know, special needs, schools, whatever. All right, so now here's the, the, the last point. Seven years ago, uh, we, I was part of a discussion group about 
the suicide rate with vet- veterans and the million veterans that are going to come back from the Middle East. Really high. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, the, uh, the, the founder of Starbucks f- flew a bunch of us up to, to Seattle to see serious about everything he can fix. <clears throat> and in the conversation, orientation of the veterans, bringing them back, back to the world, you just don't dump them right back in there with a wife and kids and, and society. Yeah. You got, you know, there's an orientation problem, housing, education, employment. I raised my hand, dog. So we started Pets and Vets, and we wanted to specialize with veterans that had PTSD. Mm-hmm. So we found contacts at the uh, VA hospitals in Livermore and Martinez so that we knew we were getting veterans. And our whole concept was, in fact, I, I think it's Elena, our, our executive director, came up with the, this amazing uh, slogan, rescuing lives at both ends of the leash. Because as you know, every animal that comes into the art program, 24 hours later would be euthanized. Yeah. So we save dogs, we save cats from around the valleys. Yep. So you bring this dog in, we save its life, we pair it with a veteran who's having PTSD issues. We thought it would work, and the response has been over, over the moon, incredible. The testimonials from veterans whose life have been impacted the quality of life's been saved oh for sure i i can attest to that when i was at the last arf when i we played i went out into the after party and was hanging out and there was a guy who was just enrolled in your program you, you guys had hooked him up with a dog it was an adorable dog yep. you know big pit bull and this dude pretty much broke down and cried yeah telling me how grateful he was for everything that you guys did to do this and it was intense you know like we're standing in the middle of the bar and he was just so grateful and humbled by it so it really is amazing incredible amazing work that you guys are doing so yeah. right right now you know we're taping this here at the art facility it's in walnut creek and shadelands 2890 yep. mitchell drive you'll see our facility and if you go to the back lot you'll see the construction of the country's very first for private facility for, for the veterans and their dogs where they're going to train uh, and, you know, also a bunch of orientation. Mm. It's, I mean, the walls are up. It's going to be by sometime in the summer. It'll be functional. And uh, that we're finding out already, Rob, this is the uh, – this goes way beyond anything that we had imagined, especially in 91 or even when we started this problem. The blueprint of what we're doing back there with that building has already drawn interest from across the country. And when that thing is, especially during the summer, when we're closer to fruition, they're finalizing it, people are going to come, and we're going to give that here. You take that to your community, and all you have to do is find a partner, an animal partner that supplies your dogs. So you're going to see what we're building back there, you know, in, in five years, there may be 50 yeah. around the country. And who benefits? The dogs and the veterans. It's great stuff, man. It is. Beyond anything we considered. Tony, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it, man. It was killer. Well, even though I'm a square and I don't do drugs. (laughs) It's okay. It's all right, man. We like it. We like it. I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, it was Hall of Famer. (laughs) Hall of Famer, the legend, Tony La Russa. with Rob Flynn.